continuing with our discussion on internet applications today we would be talking about perhaps the most widely used application that people use nowadays over the internet namely electronic mail so our topic of discussion today is electronic mail now you know everybody knows that electronic mail is perhaps the most widely used application on the internet well anybody who has a connection or connectivity to the internet invariably uses electronic mail or email which is more popularly called in some form or the other now talking about email there are a number of underlying protocols which are used in practice for instance for sending mails we use a protocol called simple mail transfer protocol or smtp in conjunction with it we use another protocol called multipurpose internet mail extension or mime on the other hand when you are receiving mails on our computers there are two other protocols which are used in fact one of these two one is post office protocol version 3 or is it is also known as pop3 in short or internet mail access protocol or imap now let us start our discussion on simple mail transfer protocol in fact this smtp forms the basis for all electronic mail transaction that takes place on the net on the internet now this smtp is the basic protocol used to send mail from one machine to the other okay so let us try to understand what this smtp protocol is what are its capabilities and limitations and how it works okay the first thing is that you can get all the details about smtp in rfc number 821 this is the corresponding rfc well smtp is a simple protocol in the sense that it has the capability of transmitting simple text messages only it cannot transmit anything other than simple text well when you say simple text it means a simple 7 bit ascii file you cannot have any international characters which may require 8 bit ascii encoding it must strictly be 7 bit ascii format where the most significant bit of the bytes will be always zero and in the smtp protocol the mails are transferred based on information which is written on the envelope of the mail just like when we send a letter to a destination we put the letter inside an envelope and on top of the envelope we write all the details namely the address which will help the post office to deliver the letter at the correct destination so in the same way well inside the envelope you have the message header message header can contain the address of the recipient and some other information this we shall see later what other information are required this the smtp while it is transferring or transmitting mails it does not look at the mail contents or the message body as long as it is in simple text format it only looks at the message header that is only important to send the mail to the correct destination so effectively a mail message looks like this there are two parts one is the message header other is the message body basically when you are trying to send a mail the mail is created by a so called user agent program which which is also sometimes called as a mail client some examples of user agent programs are outlook express outlook or you can say pine eudora this kind of mail uh, you can say client or your user agents are available based on the platform you're using you can use any one of these platforms to compose your mail whatever you are trying to send you can type in the body of the mail now once you have created a mail and has given a command to send it the messages get queued up and these messages go to the input of an smtp sender program i'm illustrating this with an example with the help of a diagram now this smtp sender program is actually responsible for sending the mails 
this SMTP sender program is run usually as a server process which for example, in the Unix environment is sometimes called a daemon, daemon process. Some examples of some SMTP server processes are send mail or queue mail. Both of these are widely used, queue mail is slightly better than send mail because of some of its attractive features. Now, let us try to illustrate the process with the help of this diagram. Here we have the user agent where the mail is getting composed, but however, this user agent may not be running the, the SMTP server program. Suppose this is the place where the nearest SMTP server program is running out here. So, this SMTP server will be acting as the SMTP sender or the mail sender. The user agent after the mail gets composed will open a connection to the SMTP server on port number 25 port number 25 is the port for SMTP server. And as you can see several mail messages might get queued up in the user agent for being processed by the SMTP sender program. So, the each of these queued up mails will be containing a mail header followed by a mail body. Now, this SMTP server program when it receives the mails it will try to forward the mail to the destination. Now, it is possible that it does not have a direct path to the destination, it may have to send the mail through a number of intermediate mail servers, this may be necessary. So, for that purpose this mail server program out here, this may send the mail to some intermediate SMTP server one or more of them with a connection on port 25 established in each case and finally, it will be delivered to an SMTP server which has a connection with the destination user mailbox directly. So, this SMTP server will receive the mail and will find that well this, this particular mail is destined to a mailbox on, on my machine. So, the mail will get deposited in the appropriate mailbox. This is how the overall thing works. So, starting from the user agent you go to an SMTP server which acts as the SMTP sender to start with. The SMTP sender will be sending the mail to another SMTP server which may simply forward it to another SMTP server and this process will go on till the mail receives the final SMTP server which acts as the final destination or receiver which accepts the mail and puts it in the user mailbox. This is how the overall SMTP mail transmission phase works. Now, in terms of the mail message contains each message that gets queued up contains of course, the text of the message. The message text in fact, contains a header and the body. Now, the header there is an RFC 822 which defines the fields of the header. So, if you look at 822 you can know all the details of the header fields. So, this header will contain message envelope containing some information as we shall see in some examples and also a list of recipients. And it will also contain the message body which of course, will be composed by the user. And in addition to the message text each queued message will also have a list of mail destinations. This list can be derived by the user agent or the SMTP server from the header. The idea is that although the mail destinations are anyway present in the header of the message, but in order to process it, in order to forward it, that same information is extracted from the mail header and also kept in a separate place, which can be accessed very fast by the mail sender program. Okay. So, the mail as a whole is kept somewhere and only the destination addresses are kept separately along with a pointer to the corresponding mail, so that it can be processed relatively fast. And this list of mail destination may sometimes require expansion of mailing list. Like you know, sometimes we have the group mail facility. We give an email address which actually is a mail alias, which actually refers to a group of email addresses. So, when a mail is being sent to that alias, that alias expands to all the email addresses that belong to that group. 
So, this kind of expansion can also take place. With respect to the SMTP sender, it takes messages from the queue one at a time. It tries to transmit it to the proper destination via an SMTP trans transaction. It is a TCP connection over port number 25. And when all the destinations corresponding to a mail has been processed, please note that a particular mail message may have more than one destinations unlike a postal mail. Okay, an electronic mail can have more than one destinations. So, when all the destinations have been processed meaning thereby the copy of the mail has been sent to all the destinations it is destined to the message is deleted from the queue. Well, some optimization are carried out by the mail server like if a message is being sent to multiple users on the same host, then the, then the mail message will be sent only once to the destination host. The delivery to the individual users will be handled at the destination host. So, if the mail is going to two different users on the same machine hotmail.com say, only a single copy of the mail will go to hotmail.com with an information on the header that this mail has to be delivered to two of these addresses. So, the final destination say hotmail.com will do the rest after receiving the body. And secondly, if there are multiple messages are ready for the given host may not be the same user, okay, multiple users then instead of sending well this is not the same message in the first case it was the same message going to more than one user on the same machine, but here multiple messages going to the same machine. Then to save time a single TCP connection can be opened and all the messages can be sent. This actually overheads, this actually reduces the overhead of uh, creating and terminating the TCP connection over port number 25 you have to do it every time you are sending mail. So, it reduces the number of time you are establishing the connection. Uh, while sending a mail there are a number of errors uh, which are often encountered like due to some problem a host may be unreachable. It can be a problem with the host, it can be a problem with the link through which the host is connected. Due to some reason the host may be out of operation, TCP connection may fail due to some error in the network, the destination address may be faulty like the name of the user or the user ID may be wrong, the target user address may have changed. Sometimes some of the mail servers allow redirection, if the user address has changed automatically the mail will be redirected to an alternate email address. Now, if this redirection is not possible usually the user is informed in the form of an error message and if this redirection feature is there then the sender can requeue the mail well after the message comes back from the final sender from the final, final mail server of which of course, it can keep in the queue for a certain period after that it will give up. Because if the mail has failed often a mail bounces with an error message that will I have kept it in my queue I am unable to have a connection or some problem. Now, the mail will remain on an outgoing queue for certain period of time that particular period of time is configurable. It can be one hour, it can be one day, it can be seven days, it can be even more. Depending on the time it uh, the, the SMTP server will be keeping on trying to send the mail during that period and if it fails within that period it will simply discard the mail after that. Okay. Talking about the reliability of the SMTP protocol, well we have mentioned that it uses TCP connection over port number 25. Well, we know that TCP is a connection oriented protocol it tries to recover from errors. Supposedly TCP is reliable, but in an application like electronic mail which runs on top of TCP there can be so many different kind of errors like I have just mentioned some host may be unreachable, some user email address may have been redirected to some other address and so on. So, under these conditions so, although TCP attempts to provide reliable service, there is no guarantee that the mail will be delivered correctly. Some messages may be lost 
there is no guarantee to recover lost messages. See although TCP tries to ensure that end to end transactions are successful for example, from your machine to the nearest SMTP server that transaction will be successful, but somewhere beyond that something might have happened which has caused the mail message to get lost. So, there is no effort made by the SMTP protocol to recover from these lost messages. Similarly, there is no end to end acknowledgement from the final destination back to the sender that is used in SMTP. Similarly, error indication report is not guaranteed. Sometimes you get back a message that that your mail has bounced, but even if you, you do not get back a message there is no guarantee that the mail has actually reached the destination. We trust SMTP well, well if you do not get an error message we assume that the mail has reached the destination, but in practice it may not be so. Well, now at the side of the receiver well when you are talking of SMTP receiver we are talking of the SMTP server at the final destination which is finally connected to the user mailboxes these are the user mailboxes. Now this SMTP receiver will be accepting the arriving messages and they will be placing the messages in the appropriate user mailboxes. If the mails are destined to a mailbox connected to the particular server, but if it finds that the destination address does not belong to a particular user in the mailbox of its own machine own server, then it copies the mail message to an outgoing queue to some other SMTP server through a process called mail forwarding. Suppose I am an SMTP server I receive a message first I see if the destination corresponds to a user on my machine or not if so I put it in the appropriate mailbox if not I try to find out which SMTP server I have to forward it next I simply forward it to the next SMTP server this is how it works. So, in doing so the receiver must verify the local mail destination of course, because it have to verify before actually putting them in the mailbox and it deals with some kind of errors like it can check whether the packet that has arrived has any error or not there is a checksum computation or it can also check whether the user mailbox where you are trying to put the mail whether it has some free space or not. Many mail servers allow something called a disk quota, but the maximum amount of space you can use for storage of a mails is limited and if that quota gets exceeded or filled up no more new messages can be put in there. Okay. So, that is also an error condition and SMTP forwarding means you have an SMTP server out here it gets a mail as an input it finds out it has to forward the mail to some other SMTP server this is a process called forwarding. Now, this forwarding may need to go through a number of intermediate mail servers in general. Now, it is possible in electronic mail in email that the sender can specify the exact route. Well, if it does not then like routing each SMTP server will try to find out the best route. Well, the sender can also specify a route through which the mail messages will go the sequence of SMTP servers the mail message will traverse before reaching the final destination mail server. So, again looking back at the same diagram I want to just make uh, one comment here. If you look at the first SMTP server in this chain the SMTP server which receives mails directly from the user agent this works as a SMTP receiver and sender both. It receives mails from the user agent over port number 25. It forwards some of the mails again over port number 25 to some other SMTP server. So, what I mean to say is that the, the intermediate SMTP server they have a dual functionality. They act as server when they are receiving mails from somebody else. 
they also act as SMTP client when they are forwarding mails to some other SMTP server. So, you see these, these SMTP nodes, intermediate nodes, they have a dual role of both client and server. They are client where they are trying to send the message to another server. They are a server when they are receiving a message from another node which is acting as the client. Okay. So, this is what we should remember. Now, talking of the basic commands that SMTP uses, well, there are commands, there are responses. The one node sends a command to the server, a client sends a command to the server, the server sends back a response to the client. Now, let us see what this command and response messages look like, what they actually mean and represent. The first thing is that this command and response the initiative lies with the sender, because if the sender is not responsive, this dialogue cannot go on. The process starts by the client establishing a TCP connection with the, with the, with the SMTP server, of course, over port number 25. There are a number of commands, we shall see it through a complete example. Sender can send some command to the receiver, an example command is hello is one such command, hello followed by a domain name, followed by carriage return and line feed. This is a command and the server after receiving the command uh, uh, reacts by responding with a reply. A typical reply looks like this. It starts with a three digit response code followed by the actual string indicating the meaning of this code. Okay. For example, 250 means requested mail action okay, completed. Okay. Talking of the three digit codes, these three digit codes can start either 2, 3, 4 or 5. Well, any number starting with 2 means positive completion. That means, it is a positive response, it is successful and the step that it is referring to has been completed successfully. Well, well anything starting with 3 this also means positive, but this is not the end of the story. We are only halfway through the process. So, this is sometimes like a positive intermediate reply. You may have to go through one or more such positive intermediate reply, so as to reach or arrive at a positive completion reply. Similarly, anything starting with 4 is a transient negative completion reply. Negative completion means some failure but transient means well we are not very sure about it yet maybe this error will be recovered but 5 starting with 5 means this error is of a permanent nature and the mail transaction has to be stopped or aborted okay these are the meaning of the codes now in terms of the dialogue that goes on between the mail client and the mail server broadly there are three steps first is the connection setup second is a step where a number of command and responses are exchanged between the client and the server and finally, the connection gets terminated. Now, let us see how these three steps look like. Well, in the, in the connection setup uh, step, the sender opens a TCP connection with the receiver. This is very easy, this can be done by the sender giving an explicit telnet command, telnet followed by the server name whatever server you are using followed by the port number of SMTP, telnet server name followed by 25. This will, this will allow the, the client to open an SMTP connection with the SMTP server. Now, once connected the receiver will identify itself by a message like 220 its domain name server ready. Sender will then identify itself by hello message, we will see a complete transaction very shortly. Receiver will accept the sender's identification by sending back a 250 positive reply. Now, if the mail service is not available at that particular point, then instead of 250 ok, so a message like this will come 421 indicating this is a negative completion reply. 
421 service not available. Okay. Now, in the second step when we are talking about the actual mail transfer commands, there are some commands which, which identify the, the email address of the source and the destination because email of email address of the destination is required for obvious reason the mail has to be delivered. Sometimes email address of the source is also required particularly when error messages have to be sent back. In case of some errors the receiver might like to send back an email message notifying the error back to the sender. So, for that reason the email address of the sender is also required to be present as part of the email message the header. So, in the mail transfer command these kind of messages are used. There is a command called mail from command which identifies the sender of the email or the originator. This as I said this is required to provide the reverse path for error reporting. Suppose you have to send back an error message we can use this email address for doing that and if the email address if it has the proper syntax this the receiver will, will return with a 250 ok message or, or if there is something wrong then there will be an appropriate failure message. Similarly, there will be a receipt to command where you can identify the email address of the recipients. There can be more than one recipient which is identified by more than one receipt to commands. There will be separate reply for each recipient. Finally, there will there is a command called data which indicates that now the actual body of the email starts. So, after the data command the client can start sending the um, messages which will form the body of the email to the mail uh, you can say to the SMTP server for processing. And this message can go on continuously the end of the message will be indicated by a line containing just a full stop or a period. So, means a full stop appearing in the first column of a line will indicate the end of the message before that you can go on typing whatever you want. Okay. And finally, when you are trying to close the connection there are two steps basically the sender or the client will be sending a quit command to the server and will wait for the reply. After the reply comes back from the server it initiates a TCP close operation. The receiver similarly after sending the response to quit it also initiates TCP close. Okay. This is how the connection is closed. Well, now we try to demonstrate an example SMTP session. Well, normally the way we send and receive mails is that we use some mail software like Outlook. Many of us also use a web based mail like Hotmail, Rediff Mail, Yahoo Mail. They have a suitable web based user interface through which we type mails. We shall see later how these are implemented in practice. See at some point in the implementation these machines where you are sending your mails the body of the mail addresses subject whatever to they must respond to the SMTP requests and responses. There must be an SMTP server situated somewhere which must be contacted to send the messages we have typed as an email message. Okay. So, this simple example that will show will demonstrate how a low level SMTP session is carried out. Well, although we may be using a high level tool or a, or a high level package to send the mail, but actually in internally these are the kind of commands that get generated automatically and your mail gets sent. So, let us see how the process starts. Here I am assuming that the client is a simple simple window a command window from where I am establishing a connection with my server well this can be any mail server I am giving a hypothetical name server name. If you give telnet over port number 25 this will open a TCP connection over port number 25. So, a TCP connection gets established over port number 25. Now, after this connection is established the dialogue 
can start. Let us see this slide shows you how the dialogue goes on. Here S indicates the mail server, client indicates the mail client. So, after the connection is established, the server responds by a welcome message 220. Suppose the server is hotmail.com server, I am connecting it to hotmail.com. It will send 220 hotmail.com simple mail transfer service ready, something like this. Now, after that, the client will give a hello message and also it will identify the domain name the client belongs to. Suppose the client belongs to the domain yahoo.com. So, it will respond by sending hello yahoo.com. The server again will be sending back a positive response that well hello yahoo.com I acknowledge you. This means that the server has identified or has registered the domain name from where the client is sending. Then again the client uses the mail from command to identify the sender of the mail. Here you can specify any ad email address you want. Well, when I say any email address, it is actually any email address. You can also write in place of uh, the email address that is specified. You can even write uh, say for example, Bill Gates at Microsoft.com. You can write anything out there. Okay. So, if the syntax is correct, the server will respond by 250 ok. Similarly, after that there can be one or more receipt to common. In fact, in this example there are two where you can specify the email addresses of the recipients. Again the server will be responding back by 250 ok messages. Okay. So, now the sender and the receiver of the mail has been identified. So, now let us prepare to send the data. So, now the client sends uh, command data. Server sends back an intermediate positive response 354 saying that start mail input end with dot. Depending on the server this mail message may differ slightly, but actually the meaning is the same. This is intermediate because the mail transfer is still in progress. The body of the mail is still being typed. So, it is just an intermediate message asking the user to type in the message and ending it with a full stop or a dot in the first column. So, after this the actual body of the mail can be typed and finally, a single dot in the first column will indicate the end of the mail message. So, at this point the server will respond by a positive response 250 ok. Then the client can send quit and the server will finally send this message and close down the connection. Now, the point to note here is that this is a simple mail dialogue I have shown. In fact, anybody can use this command to have a connection with the mail server which is available to you. For example, in your organization if you have a mail server you can directly do a telnet to your mail server over port number 25 and you can send a mail message by fabricating any arbitrary source address. Well, well, if somebody is not that much familiar with how this email headers and other stuff looks like, they might get confused by receiving a mail. For example, if I get a mail message from, from uh, say for example, Bill Gates, but without knowing that it is not really from Bill Gates, but some of my friend has played a prank on me, it is quite possible. But if I look at the email header carefully, I will know that the mail although it is saying it is coming from somebody at microsoft.com, but in fact the mail had originated in some other place. In fact, today we have so many email spam filters which are supposed to block and identify spam mails. They will in fact detect these kind of you can say mischievous mails let me call it, but otherwise this SMTP does not check for this kind of uh, what should I say misuse, misuse of mail transfer facility. Okay. So, far we have talked about how mails can be sent from one machine to other using SMTP. Now, we are talking about mail access protocol. See here the idea is like this, you have an SMTP protocol running on a machine out here. This is your SMTP server. 
but I am sitting on a computer out here and here I may be having a software like Outlook Express. So, I can establish a connection with the SMTP server and through this connection I can I can access I can read and I can send mails sitting on my computer only I need not have to log in into this SMTP server go to the SMTP server and check my mails. There are in fact two protocols which allow you to access your mails from a remote mailbox the idea is that you have a mail server located somewhere on the network your mailbox is present on that mail server you have a mail client that mail client should have a capability of pulling your mails from the mail server into your machine. So, that sitting on your machine you can view the contents of your mails. Okay. In fact, there are two protocols which are used for this purpose one is called the post office protocol version 3 or POP 3 POP 3 in short the other one is internet mail access protocol version 4 or IMAP 4. These are the two alternate uh, protocols available let us look briefly at the capabilities of this the way they work as I mentioned is like this this refers to an SMTP server mailbox this is your mail client. So, whenever the mail client wants to read mails it sends a request to the SMTP server to in fact not the SMTP server to the machine which is running the SMTP server and will be sending back the response in the form of the mails and other information you want to have a look. Now, in fact, this SMTP server is one program which is running suppose when you are trying to access a mail through POP3 you must in addition have another server the POP3 server running on the same machine as the SMTP server. Okay. So, first let us talk about POP3. So, for POP3 to work the client POP3 software must be installed on the recipient machine. Well, in fact, Outlook Express and the other mail client they have an inbuilt feature of specifying which mail client you want to have. And the server POP3 software is typically installed on your mail server the same machine which runs the SMTP server. So, the client which is the user agent here opens a connection with the server on TCP port number 110 this 110 is the port number of POP3. Then the client authenticates itself with the server by sending a valid username and password and once the verification of username password has been done the client can directly have an access to the mails sequentially one by one. So, the mails can be read by the client by transferring them from the mail server one at a time one by one sequentially. Now, when the mails are being read sequentially one after the other there are two different modes in which you can do so one is the delete mode delete mode says that as you are reading the mails they are getting deleted from a mail server. So, that you are not unnecessarily occupying the disk space of a mail server you are freeing the disk space as soon as you have brought your mails to your machine for reading. But the other option is that if you do not want to do so there is a keep mode where you can leave the mails intact in your mailbox. So, POP3 has basically commands to log in log out fetch mess messages without deleting and delete messages. So, in the delete mode fetch and delete work together in the keep mode only fetch works not delete. Okay. So, the POP3 protocol provides you with a basic facility to access mail from a remote mail server to read mails into your machine so that you can see them. But if you look at the mail clients that are available today it can be Outlook Express, it can be Hotmail, it can be Rediff Mail all of them are based on the same technology. You will find that they provide many more facilities than just reading the mails one at a time. So, there has to be something more supported by the mail access protocol than just what POP3 provides and in fact IMAP 
provides you with the answer. So, IMAP in addition to the capabilities provided by POP3, it has the following extra features. First, a user can simply check the email headers. See in POP3, you did not have an option, you have to fetch the entire mail to your machine and then view them. But using IMAP, you can simply fetch the headers of the emails. You just view the, the headers, which one you like, you just click on the header, now the mail will get transferred and you can view it. Okay. This is one option. The second is that the user can also search the contents of the email for a specific string. Suppose I want to look only at those mails which has a specific string as part of its body. So, I can even do that in IMAP and you can manage mailboxes on the mail server which was not possible in POP3. So, a user can create multiple mailboxes, delete a mailbox, rename a mailbox or also can create a hierarchy of mailboxes. Like here what I mean is that if you just recall how the typical mail uh, you can say mail utility systems work, it can be outlook, it, it can be yahoo, radio. See each of these mail servers or let us call it mail systems, they have a facility for the user to specify folders and subfolders. You can manage your mails in terms of multiple folders, you can move a mail into a folder, you can delete mails from a folder and so on. So, these kind of folder management is directly supported by IMAP. Because IMAP supports it, modern day email systems also have a facility to support it. They they indeed support this kind of you can say management of folders through the IMAP capability. Now, we talk about multipurpose internet mail extension or MIME now. Now, let us try to understand why we have to go for another protocol because using SMTP you can send mails using POP3 or IMAP you can read mails onto a machine. The main problem we have till now is that the SMTP protocol has a facility of transmitting only pure text messages, simple text messages which are encoded as 7 bit ASCII. But anything beyond that SMTP is incapable of handling. So, you must have a mechanism through which these kind of non text documents can be handled. So, the first thing is that this SMTP cannot transmit non text messages. There are some solutions which were developed earlier as ad hoc solutions. For example, in some Unix system, there was a command called UU encode. This converted a uh, non text messages into a text equivalent, but it was not accepted as standard. This existed only between Unix systems. When you want to transmit something between Unix systems, you could do this. Moreover, if you have text that includes international characters like this special symbols, which are typically encoded in 8 bit ASCII, here also your, your simple SMTP will not be allowed, will uh, not be able to handle this kind of things. So, for these kind of problems, the protocol MIME was developed. In fact, MIME can handle something more like many servers may reject mail over certain size. So, the MIME protocol also has a facility of breaking mails into smaller pieces. Moreover, some SMTP implementation do not adhere to standards like, like even if it is a text, some SMTP implementations will remove all white spaces like tabs and other things, replace them with single space. So, your mail formatting will get lost when it reaches the destination. So, MIME tries to keep this mail formatting intact in addition. 
Now, let us try to understand what is MIME, is it a new protocol in the same sense that SMTP is? See SMTP is a mail transfer protocol, it is a program which is running as a server, the client can contact the server and can start a message exchange with it. But remember MIME is a little different from SMTP in this regard, MIME is not a program which is running as a server and someone can contact with MIME and can send and receive something. MIME is not running as a server, as a daemon, rather MIME acts as a translator, MIME sits on top of SMTP, if it is a non-text mail, MIME will try to translate it in some way into an equivalent text version along with relevant information so that the final receiver can decode it back and then it can forward the message, the translated message to SMTP which can transfer it. This is the basic idea behind MIME. Now in order to have MIME, we must have some additional information in the translated version I told you. So these additional information are present in the form of 5 new message header fields in the email messages. There is something called MIME version content type, content transfer encoding, content ID and content description. They have their they have their own meaning without going into details of this, I shall be showing some examples a little later. See this content type actually means what type of content it is, whatever is following, whatever you are translating, is it an image, is it a word document, is it a PDF file, what it is. Okay. So, it specifies the type of the content. So, you can have types and subtypes, for example, it is an image, subtype it is, it is a JPEG image, subtype can also be a GIF image, so on. This transfer encoding tells you that what kind of translation you have done. There can be more than one choice available, so the receiver must be knowing about the translation you have done, so that it can it can basically translate it back to the original form. So, some of the context types, uh, some of the content type examples are given here, it can be a text body, it can be a multi part in indicating that the mail has multiple parts with the subtypes being mixed, parallel, alternative, message, several subtypes, image, video, audio, application and there are several others. Just an example, the way it is written, for example, image, you give this the type a slash followed by the subtype. This is how you specify the type and subtype. MIME transfer encoding specifies how the translation has taken place, which in technical term is called how the mail body is wrapped for transmission, because mail body has to be translated or transformed somehow into a text form, so that SMTP can transmit it, okay. this is mandatory. Content transfer encoding can have 6 possible values, out of them 7 bit, 8 bit and binary, these are special cases, there are no separate encoding required for these, because these header, these content transfer encoding type directly tells you what kind of information it is. If you are wanting to send them in plain binary, you simply send them 7 bit, 8 bit similar. There is one method called quoted printable or quote printable, here you use this for documents which contain mostly simple ASCII characters with a few non printable characters. These non printable characters can be represented by a quote followed by their hexadecimal equivalent. That is why these are called quote printable. If you have a special character, give a quote followed by its two digit hexadecimal equivalent. Okay. Base 64 is perhaps the most widely used technique for transforming arbitrary non text information into a form which can be handled by SMTP. So, it maps arbitrary binary input into printable output, we shall see how this works. And X token is a method where 
the user can specify its own non-standard encoding method. Now, to talk about the base 64 encoding method, it works like this. Base 64 encoding method can transform any non-text mes method message into its equivalent text message. Now, the way it works is like this, it takes 3 bytes of the input message at a time, it breaks it up into 4 chunks of 6 bits. So, the 3 bytes of message is broken up into 6 bits each, each of the 6 bits are expanded into 8 bits through a simple table lookup process. The table lookup process is called R64, it works like this. See in 6 bits you can have 2 to the power 6 or 64 combinations. So, from 0 0 0 0 0 0 to 1 1 1 1 1 1 there are 64 combinations. You have a table which says that for the first 26 of these you replace them by the by the ASCII code of the letters capital A to capital Z. For the next 26 replace them by the ASCII code of small a to small z. For the next 10 the digit 0 to 9 and for the last 2 plus and slash these are the 64 characters. So, each of the 64 combinations you encode them as one of 64 ASCII characters. This is how you encode it and replace each ASCII character by its 8 bit ASCII equivalent. So, 24 bit gets translated into 32 bits. So, this means an expansion in message size by 33 percent. So, some examples of MIME header. So, just you can look there are some header information there is a boundary which contains a string. This string wherever it occurs this indicates some boundary in the mail message. There can be several several such parts in the MIME header. This is another example here also there is some header here the boundary name is bound 42 here there is a boundary here there is a boundary here there is a boundary. So, the content type for example, multi part alternative means there are multiple parts in the content and alternative means the receiver can choose any one of these two alternatives depending on the capability. The first one says content type text plain the second one says text enriched. So, if your receiver mail client can display rich text then the second alternative can be chosen otherwise the first alternative. Now, I suggest you can look at the headers of some of the MIME encoded messages to understand more about how the encoding and the attachments work. The attachments when you send with a mail they get encoded in the same way. Now, with this uh, we come to the end of today's lecture, let us uh, now quickly look at the, the answers to the quiz questions which were posed as part of the last lecture. Solutions to quiz questions on lecture 9. The questions were what is an iterative server? It is one in which the client requests are processed one by one sequentially. What is a concurrent server? Here multiple client requests can be handled at the same time, multiple copies of the server are created using process system call like fork or you can also use a thread for this purpose. Which of client and server must start first obviously the server, what are the components of a socket it will be protocol local IP local port or protocol remote IP remote port it is also called half association. What is a domain? It is a set of computers which are related either by the geographic location or by the way they function. What are NAMD and NSLOOKUP? NAMD refers to the domain name server which runs on the Unix system and NSLOOKUP is a command which invokes the DNS name resolver. Through NSLOOKUP you can actually translate a name into an address. How does recursive name resolution work? Host sends a request to a DNS server. D this DNS server recursively forwards the request to other DNS server. The responses are sent back to the to the initial host along the same path. 
through the request that went. How can you connect to a server xyz.com over port number 12134 by a command like this telnet server name followed by port number. Why does FTP use more than one port numbers? The first port number 21 is used for control connection and the other one is used for actual data transfer. What are the function of the hash and bin command in FTP? This hash indicates the status of the file transfer. It displays some hash symbols continuously. Each hash indicates a chunk of data transfer either 2 kilobyte or 4 kilobyte or 8 kilobyte depending on the system. And bin selects that you are trying to transmit a non text file a binary file. Now some questions on today's lecture. What are the basic drawbacks of SMTP? Which port number do SMTP servers use for ac accepting client requests? Why does MIME does not have any port number associated with it? Under what condition can an SMTP server also act as a mail client? What are the purposes of the mail from and receive to commands in SMTP? What is the difference between CC and BCC in the SMTP header? This is something I suggest you can look up and find out the solution. Why is IMAP preferred over POP3? A message of size 3000 bytes is encoded using base 64 scheme. What will be the size of the encoded message? Is it mandatory for the DNS server to run on the same machine that runs the SMTP server? How are mail attachments handled in MIME? Now with this uh, we come to the end of today's lecture. In our next lecture we shall be starting our discussion on the world wide web which is yet another very popular application that we have on the internet. Thank you. Now in the last class uh, we were talking about electronic mail which is one of the most widely used application on the internet. Today we will be starting our discussion on another very popular application which I am sure all of you are already familiar with. You must have you must have used it in practice and it is the world wide web. Now this world wide web has become so popular that today world wide web and internet they are used synonymously. Sometimes this world wide web or www is meant to be referring to internet or vice versa. So, this is an impact of the popularity of this www. 